So crisis this morning, we're on page 146 in your 40 days. By the way, day 40 or 36 today. Can you believe it? Some of you have actually prayed 36 days in a row. Like you're wanting to call Guinness and say, is there a world record for this thing? Which by the way, like you, you don't have it at 36, but you might as well check in anyway. 36 days, per, um, uh, uh, 40 days of prayer. It's been absolutely incredible. I want to encourage you at the end of day 40, on day 41, don't stop your habit. I know for me and my family, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to open up the Bible app, and we're now going to start doing daily readings just out of the Bible app. If you don't have that, you can find it on your Google store as well as Apple. And it's just very simple reading plans that you can actually invite friends to see what you're doing. And it's great when other people know that you're supposed to be reading and they can see that you didn't. It's fantastic peer pressure. So feel free to sign up for that. But in a crisis, what we're talking about is a sudden or unexpected bad situation. And by the way, if you're watching us online right now, we're thrilled that you're tuning in. Welcome to Navigation Church Online. Uh, we're, again, welcome you to open up your book. And if you don't have your book with you, there's notes in the back that you can always fill in the blank later. And so we're talking about unexpected or bad situations. Around Navigation Church, we actually call it one of our five Ps. And this is a pivotable, 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 still haven't got pivotal moment, pivotal. There it is. We can edit that out. Pivotal moment in our life, but around here, we don't think bad situations are the only times we pivot. Like if you've never had a child and you get pregnant and you're about to bring a baby into your new home, congratulations. You're about to pivot into a brand new moment of your life and you want to have a partner come alongside with you to help you know what you're coming to expect. Uh, maybe you're getting married and you're 30 years old and you're used to life on your own and pretty much you're going to get married. Guess what? You can't do life on your own anymore. That's a pivotal moment, but it should be a good one. It should be one you're excited about. But when we're talking about a crisis, it is something that's beyond your control that you can't solve by yourself. Okay, this is a doctor's report that you can't solve on your own. This is a, a child that has made a decision, an accident that's happened in a workplace, a, uh, maybe a choice that you made that the repercussions of it you never saw coming. And you just need something bigger than you. And so today we're going to talk about a guy named Jehoshaphat. So if you don't know much about the Old Testament, here's, here it is in a thumbnail. In the Old Testament, the old part of your Bible, the Old Covenant, um, God had a nation called Israel. Israel had kings. And there were only two types of kings, good kings and bad kings. And if anyone ever says, hey, have you heard of this king before? Was he good or bad? Just say bad. You have a better chance of being right because most of the kings of Israel, they didn't do it correctly. Not Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was actually one of the good kings. He respected God. He followed the laws. The people respected him. He was a good, healthy king, except one morning he woke up in a crisis because he woke up to a guy coming, running into his chambers to say this, there are three other nations that have come together to plot against you to come kill you. They're one day away from being here to destroy us. May I just go on record? That's the definition of a crisis. Right? And so we're going to open up right here in the six lessons that we learned from King Jehoshaphat. By the way, we have four pages of notes to get through. So if you think, wow, we're going through this pretty fast. Yeah, we got 25 minutes. Let's hit the ground running. Number one, we need to turn to God for help. It's the easiest thing to turn to other people, turn to friends, turn to allies. But Jehoshaphat said this. He was terrified in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3. Terrified by the news and begged the Lord for his guidance, and he ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. Prayer shouldn't be our last resort, it should be our first option. Jehoshaphat didn't wait till he pulled the generals together. What is it that we need to do? He didn't pull all his counselors together, give us some battle strategies. He didn't pull everybody and say, what can we do to get out of this problem? The very first thing he did was didn't resort to prayer, but he went to prayer. And so many times, and I'll say this, for me, I immediately go into my cleric brain, my type A personality brain, to go, how do I fix this? Versus pausing for a minute to go, God, you probably saw this coming. And just kind of get a little guidance. But then here's the other thing that I love that he did. It's just brilliant that you need to figure this out for yourself. Is he told the whole nation about it. How many times when we have a problem in our life, do we think to ourselves, I can solve this. I can do this. I can take care of this. Well, here, here's the phrase we say because we're, we're such great friends and we serve other people. I wouldn't want to bother Pastor Brent with my problems. 
right? How many do that before? I wouldn't want to bother my wife with my problems. I wouldn't want to bother my husband. I wouldn't want to bother my friend Aaron with my problems. I can keep this myself. Why? Because I can do this myself because I'm a man. That is anti anything that we see here. Number one, we ask for God for help and we do it two ways. One, we speak to him and we tell other people about it because Christianity, you may need to write this down if you don't know it already, Christianity is not a solo sport. We're in this together. Do you know he always calls us the body of Christ? A, a thumb out by itself is a dead thumb, okay? So like there's brilliance there. You don't need to write down that one. Never let a problem intimidate you. Instead, let it motivate you to pray, seek God for wisdom before you do anything else. And then when you go to God for help, there's gonna be four things underneath here that you do. The first thing is you need to remember how big God is. So I've been under pressure this week because I always feel like as a pastor, here's what, I feel like every week I need to bring something brand new that I've never said before. The problem is we're on day 36 of 40 days of prayer. I'm now preaching about prayer again. There's a chance I'm going to repeat myself. And if it's so good, you may need to know it so it bears repeating. So ready for this? Our prayer life is like a teeter-totter. When our problems are very big, our God is very small. But when our God is very big, our problems are very small. So we need, to, we need to remember how big God is because, oh, Lord, God, our Father, are you not the God who is in heaven, the ruler of a kingdom of all the nations? Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. So from step number one, we start praising God and remembering who he is, and here's what happens in our life. The moment we get a proper perspective of who God is, it puts our problems in the proper perspective. And so we need to remember how big God is. Remember what God has done for us. This is different than who God is. This is what God has done for us. Oh God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of the land uh, before the people of Israel? Remember what your God has done to you and your faith. So in my office, right-hand drawer, I have a little filing cabinet, and there's a folder in there. Uh, it just labeled sermon ideas. And if I see something, hear something, think about something, like here's a weird one for you. I like... I, I'm embarrassed to even tell you because I don't think I'll ever do this one. Like, there's so many animals in the world that are so unique. I'd like to study these animals and then talk about what we can see from God from these animals. And, like, it makes sense in my head, but I've never presented it yet. So, like, it's, some ideas are good ideas, some are bad. But one that's in there is actually called memorial stones. Because I think as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to learn in our life when God does something for us, how do we set up a memorial stone that we never forget that he did it? Do you know there was a time that the children of Israel, this is, by the way, in your Old Testament, if you don't know it, basically there's a whole group of people that God rescued and sent them across this river called Jordan. And when he, they got to the other side, here's what God told them to do. Pile up rocks in a big pile. Why? So that every time anyone sees those rocks, because it's not, that's not natural. That's man-made. Every time someone sees those rocks, they go, what is that rock there for? You can say God delivered Israel across the Jordan into the promise. Like we on our life, you have to take time to set up memorial stones. Some of you, you're artists and you write songs about it. That's fantastic. Some of you, I know people that have gotten tattoos on themselves because they want to remember what God did in that moment. Others of you are journalers. You write it down. But here's what I say. You cannot forget what God's done for you in your past or you'll doubt him with your future. Right? So then we have to remember what God's promised. Because why? We can take him at his word. He is not man that he should lie. Did you not? And this is, once again, Jehos Jehoshaphat talking to him. I think I'll just call him Joe from now on. Did you not give this land forever to your descendants, Abraham, your friend? God has promises that you should remind him of. And I think I've said this before, but it bears repeating. Where are God's promises? In his word. Why do you need to be in his word? Because there's more than 6,000 promises he has for you. You watching online right now, you're home, you're with six, sick kids, you couldn't get out today, you're questioning your faith. There are promises that God has for you in his word that are still alive today for you to count, apprehend. So if you're in a place of crisis, I guarantee you the crisis breaker is on his way because he has had promises for you. And then the final thing is you appeal to God's character. And you say, 
Jehoshaphat said this, you would not allow us to invade their territories when it came up from Egypt. So we turned away from them and did not destroy them. Why? Because actually what he's doing right there, he's appealing to God's justice. So God, you're a just God. But now, see how they're repaying us? So our God, will you not judge them? The same just God that was for them it should be the same God just for us. And so are you not, did you not, will you not? Those are the questions that Je Jehoshaphat is really asking here. So as I go to God for help, I'm saying to him, are you not, did you not, will you not? But in essence, Joseph said to God, I know who you are, I know what you have done, and I know what you have said, I know what you can do, so I'm asking you to do it again. Just so you know, like all week when I've been reading that line, I wanted the band to run back up here and do that song, because you can do it again. That was almost singing. Don't count it, though. But, like, see, here's the thing. You have to know who's on your side. I know this is a story that I've shared before, and so if you've heard it, enjoy it again. If you haven't heard it, I have a doozy for you. Years ago, I was uh, the, the St. Louis Rams. You guys remember we used to have a football team? They were over in St. Louis. Yeah, they end up getting rich and going to L.A. So, so they were over in St. Louis. It was time of the Super Bowl. My brother and I, my brother and I, I have an older brother, uh, we didn't have tickets to the game, but a bunch of our friends did. So we were oh, just downtown St. Louis tailgating. And he had his dog with him. Her name was Satin, beautiful, full-blooded Rottweiler, gorgeous dog. And we decided just to go for a little bit of walk, you know, see, kind of see the, the, the bars and the stores that were down there. We came back, and when we came back, we found that something that was a part of our tailgate had been stolen. So my brother goes, hey, let's just walk around and see if we can find it. So we started walking around all of a sudden, and as we're walking around, uh, we end up finding this stolen item, and it was with these group of guys. So my brother said, hey, man, that, that's ours. That's not yours. And this group, I remember it being 423 people. <laughs> like it was, it was, it was three, three different nations that have teamed up together to come after us, but it was a huge army. And all of a sudden, they kind of started bowing up. And my brother, he's just like, man, I just want my stuff. And they start bowing up, and my thought was, Oh, God, I don't want to get hit because I've never been in a fight in my life. I don't want to be hit. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I have a glass jaw. I will lay on the ground and say that you've won. I don't, I don't want violence. I don't want it, don't want it, don't want it. And I know right now there's some of you being like, be a man, step up. I am being a man. I'm a weak man. I'm a fragile man. And I'm standing there with satin on a leash. Denny's standing in front of me. These, I, I probably, there's at least 12 guys kind of bowing up. I'm looking at this guy going, if nothing else, you're getting punched. Like, you're getting punched. I don't know if I'll hit him because he'll probably go like this. Like, like <laughs> I've watched only fake wrestling, so I'm going to DDT you with a suplex. So I'm like standing there, and all of a sudden, they started like bowing up enough, kind of starting rising up enough, where next thing I know, I'm holding a leash, but satin has slipped out of her collar went next to Denny, put four, her four legs on the ground, and started growling in a way I've never seen before. Next thing you know, these 12 guys, who however many, started just backing up. And all of a sudden, I started stepping up. <laughs> what you got now? Yeah, you best back down. That is ours. Like, all of a sudden, because here's what I, I finally realized in the middle of my crisis, who was with me? Do you understand when you're in the middle of a crisis, who is with you? And if you don't know who's with you, you start backing down, cowering away, afraid of what's going to happen. But the moment we let him slip his leash and he starts barking in a way you've never seen him before, you just start stepping up going, this ain't no crisis. You're just going to start crying. We got to figure out who's on our side. So good. The story still works. Here it is. Number two, we have to admit our inadequacy. In case no one's told you today, I love you enough to let you know this. You're not good at everything. See, like, I feel like, like the end. Well, let's take our prayer. Okay, like you have to know that you're inadequate. And so here's what he said. Joseph had said, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do crisis, sudden or unexpected bad situation you can't do anything about. But ready for this? Miracles will never happen until you admit that the situation is impossible without the help of God. You know, we all want miracles in our life. We just don't want to be in the situation that puts us to need a miracle. But how can God show himself miraculous if you never need? So with man, 
this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. Your inadequacy is no surprise to God. And so a couple weeks ago, I've said it once, but it bears repeating again. We did something called the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, we had something called the daily bread that we need to eat. Are you ready to eat the bread of inadequacy? Because if you're in the middle of crisis, that's the bread that you're eating. Because you can't do what you need to do to get you out of the doo-doo that you're in. Yes, I just made that up now. That, boop, that won't become a clip. Okay, so then number three, rely on God's resources. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you. That's what Jehoshaphat said. God, we do not have the resources, so we are going to fix our eyes on you. It is time, and you're in the middle of a crisis, to shift your focus. This is the top of page 148. Shift your focus from your problem to your problem solver. Question, when crisis hits, where do you fix your eyes on to? Do you fix your, okay, by the way, let's just be honest here. We usually fix our eyes on to doubting the situation. Uh, insecurities about who we are. You go as far as questioning your faith, questioning God, questioning his love. We go into fear, anxiety, loss of sleep. You think you're fixing the problem because you're telling everybody you know about the problem, but you're doing nothing but having glorified gossip about a situation that you personally are going through. Versus at what point do we just stop and say, I can't, will you? I mean, it's that simple. Because if we're focused on a really small God, there will be a really big problem. But the moment we start focusing our, our attention on who God is, he becomes really big in our problem. It, it gets small not because the situation has changed, but your perspective has. You have the God of the universe, king of the world, lover of our souls, that is now saying, I got you on this. It was la last night, um, I was up here kind of late, and my youngest boy, Silas, he was at a birthday party, and he decided to throw up on the floor. That's a, I wasn't there, so I don't care. Um, and, and so he's at home, and then he started feeling better, and we know he felt better because he shouted from the rooftop, running around the house, excited that he's feeling better. I just need to come up here, do a handful of quick things, and I said, hey, buddy, you want to just ride with daddy? Get out of the house. So we came up here, and as we were walking through the halls that he was considering dark, he said this. He goes, oh, I'm so afraid. I go, why are you afraid? He goes, it's dark. I go, who are you with? He goes, you. <laughs> that one, you guys missed that punchline, really. It was supposed to be powerful and spiritual, but those watching online, everyone's laughing at my expense. We appreciate it. But I go, I go no, buddy, buddy, who are you with? He goes, oh, I'm with my daddy. I said, would your daddy ever let something happen to you in the dark? And he goes, never. All of a sudden, he wasn't afraid of the dark because of who he was with. So we have to be able to, and then here's what we do then. Now that we know who we're with, now that we've let this dog off the leash, now that we know our father's in the dark with us, you relax in your faith. You relax in your faith. Jehoshaphat outnumbered three to one. God said this to him, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Ready for this? The battle is not yours. Wait, I don't have to pick up a, a sword, a, sh a shield. I don't have to pull out a Smith and Wesson. I don't have to go to battle. I don't have to go to, I don't have to get a lawyer. I don't have to go to court. I don't have to sign that contract. It's God's. You will not have to fight this. My, I, here's, here's the thing I love. How can we ever know that we serve a big God if we never have big problems? Right now, if your God is small, I'm going to start praying that he sends a big problem your way. Because I'll tell you now, I have big problems in my life. But I'm, I, don't, I promise I don't lose sleep about it one bit because I'm either in the will of God or I'm not. I either believe he controls my destiny or he doesn't. And so, listen, I'm, I'm grateful. Here, next time you have a big problem come along, you, here's your, where you start worshiping. Oh, God, thank you that I'm going to actually see how big you can be. You change your perspective on it. Oh, my gosh, I just lost my house to a fire. God, you're going to be awesome in this situation. I promise you, your friends will get you institutionalized. You worship like that. 
He said, take up your positions firm and see deliverance. The Lord will give you. Do not be afraid or discouraged two different times saying, do not be afraid. Sometimes in the battle, it takes more than courage to do nothing than something. Right? Because we want to beat the situation. We want to manipulate the situation. We want to fix the situation. But what if God says, sit with the situation? I, I, here, here's a battle. I, just lately, when it comes to a contractual thing that I've been uh, engaged in, I've been wanting to go to battle. People around me have been counseling me to not only go to battle, but to get attorneys to help with the battle. But my problem is, I have, not, I have not been released by God to do that. And I know that sounds weird, and it feels like I'm throwing out some uh, Christian excuse not to act. But here's the thing. If it is not well with my soul, then how can I do what God hasn't called me to do? But I actually feel that in this place and where we're at and as the church, as we're growing and moving and changing all these different things, at this place, I feel like I'm supposed to relax in the faith because either he promised me things in the past or I heard him wrong. It's hard to say that I've heard him wrong when two different people in two different places said the exact same thing to me when they didn't even know me. So how can we just relax in this here? Hey, the, your book says it this way. When you put your life into God's hands, your battles become his battles and your enemies become his enemies. And God says to you, just like, <laughs> I love it, just what he said to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, relax, I got this. Do you know there's a sign in heaven? I can't prove this in the Bible, but there's a sign in heaven that says no freaking out aloud. Yeah, I, I think I can prove it in the Bible, but I'd be lying, so I shouldn't. So, like, you're not allowed to do it. Um, you, we don't freak out because we're with the God of the universe that has this under control. And so um, may, maybe here's a life lesson point that I'd like to throw out. If you are consistently worn out in your life, exhausted from the day, here's the question you should maybe ask yourself and have an honest conversation with God. Are there battles that I'm fighting that I should not be fighting? I think that's a takeaway that we all should walk away with today. Because listen, exhaustion is an indicator on the dashboard of our life. And if you're exhausted, why are you exhausted? Well, I just had to work three back-to-back-to-back shifts. Okay, you should be tired. But man, it was a normal eight-hour day, and the people have exhausted you. The contractor has exhausted you. Your boss has exhausted you. Your kids have exhausted you. I'm going to go with it's you. So what are the battles that you shouldn't be fighting? Then we're going to thank God in advance. Sing victory songs before you even see the victory. So here's the picture that you need to get in your head. So Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army, singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So all of a sudden, God's pulling together his army. You know, I mean, he has, he has Iron Man and Black Widow. And I mean, he, he has Captain America. Like, he has the baddest of the bad behind him, ready to go out to this battle. But then he goes, hey, worship team, we need you, acoustic, acoustic guitar. Yep, go ahead and bring that. Come stand right here. Oh, the little triangles. Fantastic. Go ahead and bring that up here. A trumpet. Yeah, not a shofar. Put it back. A trumpet. Fantastic. Don't touch the tambourines. I'll smack you. Like, like, I just, if you grew up in church as long as me, you got to put those down. But so now all of a sudden the choir is up front without shofars and tambourines. And unless you love Miriam, then she can play it. Just like four of you are going to get that joke, but you got to go to Exodus to read it. So You now are going to start marching towards your enemies. That was such insider joke. I appreciate you guys letting me entertain me on that one. So you start marching with all your warriors behind you, all the big guns behind you. We bring the sacrifice of praise. And that's, that's the song I got to go with. That's old school for you. So you can do it again. Like, like you're like singing going out. This has to be the worst battle strategy you've ever heard of. But here's what it should tell you. The moment you have a crisis hit, if you start rambling in anger, you don't have God's battle plan. If you start talking how you're going to fight them, you don't have God's battle, battle strategy. If you start saying why they're wrong and you're right, you don't have God's battle strategy. Until you start putting, ready for the, there's a good old fashioned phrase for you, the praises of God on your lips, you don't have the right battle strategy. And so we have to thank God in advance. Why? Thanking God for what he's going to do, even though you don't know how he's going to do it, you need to thank God after the fact, that's gratitude. But if you thank God in advance, that's faith. 
Do you have the faith to thank him before he solved the issue that you're, the crisis that you're currently in? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that his rewards, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. The highest form of faith that we can thank God is to bless him before your answer ever came your way. So the Israel stood firm. They did not run in fear. They stood firm in their faith. They didn't have to lift a finger. They just lift their voices in worship and their enemy self-destructed. There is power in praise. This bears repeating itself because we said it almost every single sermon during this 40 days. At some point in your prayer life, you start with worship. So before you go into your battle, you start with worship. The Lord's Prayer taught us to start with worship, end with worship. And here's what's something that happens when you have God in his proper place, when you remind him what he's done before, when you relax in his faith, when you praise him in the midst of the battle, you expect God to turn the battle into blessings, our final point. And here's the result. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amount. Oh, that's because I missed a scripture for you. Uh, you ready for this? By the time Israel got to the three nations, everyone was dead. The three nations turned on themselves and fought among themselves and killed each other. To the point that not a single one of the enemy had escaped, and King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amount of equipment, clothing, and valuables, more than they could even carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days to collect it all. On the fourth day, they gathered into the Valley of Blessing, which got his name from this. Oh, look at that. They set up a memorial stone. They set up a place where God had met them before. And the people praised and thanked God. It was still called the Valley of Blessing to this day. And you go, well, I doubt the person that I'm in a crisis with is going to die. And I get to take all their stuff. You're missing the bigger picture here. What is the valuable lesson that you learned in your life that only came about because of the crisis that you went through? That, that's the key here. See, if you get to the other side of a crisis and you're worse for the wearer, then I'm not sure you went through the battle the way that God planned on it. But if you go through the battle and you go, wow, I never would have learned this if I never would have been through this, and then you do this, God, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to see this in the middle of this crisis. And thank you for letting me understand this. And here's what happens. Here, here's a litmus test of did you actually achieve this? Because when the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemy of Israel, the fear of God came over all of them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace for God has given him rest on every side. When you actually get through a crisis and you receive the reward of the lesson learned in that crisis, it should be a testimony to the people around you that God was in this. Man, how did you survive your ch losing a child at a young age? How did you survive cancer? How did you survive losing your job and being without work? How did you survive this? And you say, but God. Oh, man, let me tell you the faithfulness of my Savior. And so if you're in the middle of a crisis right now, I know this is going to sound weird. Go to page 146, start on point one, and just go, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you for help. And by the way, this isn't a, a one-minute prayer. This is a one-week prayer. This is a one-month prayer. This is a one-crisis prayer. And I want to encourage you to actually take the six steps that we learned from Jehoshaphat to meet God in your crisis. Why? So that on the backside, you can be a testimony to the world around you. You can have valuables that you never would have had without going for it. And the best thing of all, you get to see how great your God is in the midst of, of a bad, bad, bad situation. Amen? You know, I think one valuable thing that I've taken from my life is I know how much God's saving grace can change a life because I know how much he changed mine. I know my past. I know how I've hurt friends, wounded families, disappointed parents. I know that God showed himself to me real when I was a kid, but somewhere in those teenage years, this darn thing called puberty, I decided I think I know what's best for me. And through personal desires, addictions, lust and wants, I walked away from God. But there was still a moment in the middle of that spiritual crisis in my life, God showed himself faithful to me. Not only showed himself faithful to me, I can say this, my father hugged me. And it forever changed my life. And the, the, the worst crisis that you can be in is a spiritual crisis. 
But I'm confident if he did it once, he can do it again. And if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would say this, you may be having a spiritual crisis because the God who created you is the God who wants to save you. And he loves you so much that next Sunday we celebrate how much he loves you. He came out of heaven onto earth to actually, actually be executed at a Roman cross so that his blood could be poured out. And I know this may sound weird if you're new to God, but it makes so much sense when you see it in the totality of the book. But his blood was meant to cover your sins. So instead of your blood paying the price at the end of your life, his does now. And you can live life and life abundance. You can live with Christ here on earth as well as eternity in heaven. So if you're here today and everything that I just said kind of rings true and your heart's beating, your mind's racing and going, listen, I've been told about God. I know a little bit about God, but I think I want to follow this God. I'm going to ask you to do one simple ask. In just a minute, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and say, that is me. And the same question is going out to every person watching us online right now is, is today the day that you move out of your spiritual crisis into spiritual life? But to make you as comfortable as I could, could I just ask everyone for the next two minutes, close your eyes, bow your heads, and, and really separate yourself from those around you so that if there's someone here today ready to take their first step in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, they can. And it's simply this question. If you're here today and you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you're watching us online, if today's the day that you're ready to say yes to him with every eye closed and head bowed, could I just ask you to simply raise your hand in the air just so that I can see that you've made that decision. And if you're watching us online right now, you may be by yourself, you may be with a group of people, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. It's just raise your hand in the air so that you can make a physical movement, a physical decision about an internal change that you've done. And with the hands that were raised here at, the, at, at Navigation Church, physical, I'm going to ask digital, you to do the same thing. Could you repeat this prayer with me? As we all say this, dear Heavenly Father, I am ready to move out of this crisis of my spirit and move into your eternal life. Forgive me this day of all my sins. Become Lord of my life. And on this day, I choose to be a follower of Christ. God, I thank you. If there's anyone here in the middle of a crisis right now, um, Lord, the thing that's just weighing heavy on me is they're in the middle of a crisis, but they haven't told anybody. And I could talk about the prayer, pray part. I could talk about relying and re relaxing in your faith. And there's so many aspects of this step. But Lord, I pray for every person that's in the middle of a crisis right now. If they haven't told anybody else, if they don't have anybody else in this battle with them, I pray right now, I pray for courage for them to step up and ask for help. For me, sure. From a friend, absolutely. From their nav groups, without a doubt. But God, more than anything, from you and you alone. I pray for courage to be released in this place. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>